Welcome to Sharing Hope. I suppose if we need anything right now, we need some hope. My name is Jamie George. I've spent the last 30 years as pastor, writer, and coach. And along the way, I've met some wonderful people, people that have inspired me with their stories. And for this moment in living history, I'm partnering with MediShare to bring these inspiring stories and these amazing people to you. So our first guest today is Mark Stewart. Mark was the front man for the award-winning rock band Audio Adrenaline. You may remember them from the 90s and 2000s, songs like Big House and Ocean Floor and Bloom. During that time, Mark and his, his partner in crime, Will McGinnis, a bass player, started a, a nonprofit in Haiti called mm. Hands and Feet. And that's been a big part of Mark's life since the band. And so Mark's with us today, and I'm excited about catching up with him. He's a good friend, and we haven't talked in a while. So, I mean, since all the craziness, how are you? Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm good. I'm good to see you. Uh, miss you. Can't wait till we can go grab some coffee and not get dirty looks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where in the planet are you right now? I'm in Franklin, Tennessee. Oh, we have a right. house here in Franklin, but... You know, we do, uh, you probably ask that because we've been traveling a lot. Yes, yes, our, yes, my family yes. travels in a motorhome uh, all over the country and visiting national parks. And I do a lot of speaking myself, so that's what I do. But right now we're kind of locked down with everybody else at our house here in Franklin, Tennessee. So how are you coping? How, how are you and Aegis and the kids? You know, it's, it's been a journey. Uh, you know, it's just there's been good days and bad days. You know, I lost my job. You know, so what I was counting on for the whole year for salary is gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my whole life is kind of wrapped up in events or live entertainment, at, you know, at this point, which has pretty much been that way my whole life. And yeah. that whole industry has been shut down. Um, so I, I don't know right now. It's a little rough. Um, so I'm definitely dealing with some anxiety on that front, you know, and then there's always that underlying control issue. I'm like, I have no idea what's next, you know? Yeah. So we're hoping for, you know, fall tours to kick back up, but we don't know. So I'm just kind of living in the unknown of all that right now. And then kind of overlaying on top of that, um, I live, we live with my wife's parents. So that's a little crazy. <laughs> we're like, so we're like, we, we could do this normally because we're gone a lot. Or right, I'm gone, right, right, right. Period, but now we're all stuck in a house so you get to play like charades every night i mean is it just is it just glorious i mean uh. it's just wonderful <laughs> no la well it's been a little bit it, it's been good i'm not gonna lie but yesterday right, right. my uh my mother-in-law had this great idea we really need the kids to watch ben hur oh i'm like I i've never even seen ben hur what's ben hur i've heard about it it's a four-hour movie about this <laughs> chariot driver that's made in the 50s my kids are just like Oh my gosh, get dad seriously. <laughs> but um it's culture, so there's, right? There's, like it's yeah, culture. yeah, we're being cultured. It's a lot of give and take. There's frustrating moments because we love to be outside and yeah. hiking and the national parks. You are, guys are totally an outdoor family, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's been rough, you know. So there's anxiety, there's frustration, but there's also a lot of learning and a lot of like uh I guess fruit that comes out of stuff that dies off you know mm. yeah you you and i've walked through enough life that um uncertainty is not exactly new for you no and i mean you and you've had some massive pivots in your life yeah. so it is interesting thinking about this one and i'm like immediately going back to a conversation you and i had in the old factory in Frank, in franklin at one point when you were going hey i'm i'm actually not really sure what's next yeah go back to one of the seasons of uncertainty in your life and maybe it'd be interesting and i'm i'm personally curious because i i find myself like you i have an anxiety financial anxiety questions about the future where is this whole, whole thing going like you but go back to one of those moments of uncertainty and and talk about what was challenging and and what you did to get through it and then maybe how you're different because of it because yeah. may, maybe we both can be reminded and inspired by that. But go back, pick one of those times in your life. Yeah, there, there was a kind of a rock bottom moment uh, for me. You know, I was a musician, like you said. And we were pretty much like at the top of our career. Um, 
and I was losing really everything. While I was at the top, I could see it all crumbling down. Um, so at the very height of our musical career, I began to develop a vocal disorder. I didn't know it at the time. I just thought I was hoarse. But I, I developed an incurable vocal disorder called spasmodic dysphonia, and I still struggle with it today, as you can hear. So uh, I had all these people relying on me and this, these little two vocal cords in my neck that I couldn't fix. I'd go to doctors, they couldn't fix it. And it felt a lot like today. Like, it, you know, you look at the, the statistics and the chart keeps going up. You're like, surely this is going to end sooner. There's going to be an answer, but you just left with more questions. That's how I felt in the middle of this career was surely, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm like, God wouldn't bring me this far to give me this career just to end in the middle of it, right at the best part. Mm. But in essence, that's what happened. I lost my voice. Uh, I, I lost control. I had to surrender that completely. Just like, well, that's gone. And at the same time, uh, my wife left me too. So I, I, was, I was broken to the point where I, I never thought about taking my life or anything like that. I didn't give up on my faith in God, but I just simply believed that he didn't have anything good left for me mm. that I was like, well, this is um, kind of the rest of my life's going to be diminished or a broken version mm. of what used to be that mm. there was nothing good left. Um, and I don't really have any big secrets about like a, like a one, two, three step program, how to get out of that. Um, in fact, I, I, I just was met, and, and honestly, there, there was a couple things that really happened to me. I, there was a moment in a Bronco where God showed up and just, he kind of said something to me like, hey, I was, I was here all along. Even wait, in wait. Midst- you got to tell this story. Now, I know you, a book, you, just, you wrote a book, a book just came out, and this story is in the book, but you got to tell yeah. us this story because I love this story. Okay, well, I was on tour with a band called Mercy Me. Mercy Me was the, that, they had a big movie a couple years ago. I can only imagine. We were on tour with those guys. And um, all this was coming to an end for me. Uh, my, it was our farewell tour. I was kind of screeching and scratching my way through this farewell tour. I just wrapped up a divorce. It was really good times for me. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> and um, it was the dead of winter. We'd finished up this tour. And, and touring now had become really a hell for me. It was mm-hmm. almost like I couldn't do what I was supposed to do. It was mm-hmm. embarrassing. Mm-hmm. People were like, man, it sounds terrible. I don't like to be pitied you know right right <laughs> so right, it's like, right. It was like gosh this is horrible and um i'd kept my divorce and what was going on with my wife kind of in and really secret from the guys in the band for a long time and my parents because i just wanted to protect the future of my marriage if possible to be honest with you because mm. it was just like and, and protect her then all it just kind of all fell apart one night uh, she was leaving, and we, um, a friend, of, a friend of mine, and myself, we packed up most of the furniture in the house, and I, in a U-Haul truck. It was like December the eighth or something like that, and uh, it was cold that night. And I just watched her drive away, and um, and it just became real to me that I had no kids, my wife's gone, and I went back into this empty house and cried myself to sleep on a floor. I had lost everything that, mm. that meant something to me. Mm. Even my dignity was gone. Mm. And, um, and I just cried out to God, my God, I, 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 this sucks. I really didn't ask for help. I was just saying this is terrible. <laughs> I didn't, couldn't even muster up the, hey, get me out of this. I was just like, there's no way out, but mm. this sucks. Yeah. Um, so the next morning I get up still, in the this sucks mode and uh everything's frozen over it was like death occurred and uh, overnight in tennessee everything was frosted and had this old bronco Uh, my wife had we had a car that was newer and she would let she took that and i had my old bronco which had it really wasn't a beater but it was pretty old at this time like 15 years old and um and the battery was dead and i knew it because it hadn't been started so i'm like this (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to have to call somebody to come get me because I had an appointment at the office. I'm like, man, I'm a loser. Mm. I, have, I have no career, no furniture, no wife, no hope, no dignity. Mm. 
and I got to call a buddy to come and pick me up. Mm. So I walk out to my Bronco and I'm like, I sit in the, it was like pleather seats, you know, from the <laughs> early 90s. And I'm like, God, I, I just need you to start my truck. That's all I really want you to do. So that was the first time I reached out to God and mm. asked him to do something about yeah, it. Yeah. I was just complaining. <laughs> and um, I stuck the key in and I, it was all iced. Or I couldn't even see outside. And I just said, God, let me know you're here to start my truck. And I, boom, it turned over and it started. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> and then music had filled the cab of this Bronco. Because the radio was just on? The radio was just on. Okay. And I, and the irony or the beautiful thing was this was, who was on the radio was me singing to myself. <laughs> and um, it just so happens that when just, you turn the truck on, your voice is... I'm singing a song to myself, a song that I had written about eight years before for a buddy of mine who was going through a divorce. Oh my. That had lost everything. And he had said to me in, a, in my living room eight years prior, he goes, Mark, I, I need God just to help me breathe. Mm -hmm. Every breath is a struggle. I just have to be reminded that he and he goes, but it's the, I've lost everything, but it's the most beautiful time of, of reliance on God that I've ever experienced. And I'm like, I got to write a song. So I wrote him the song called Good Life about the, the kind of the juxtaposition of losing everything to find what was really important. Mm. And in that moment, in that Bronco, eight years later, the moment I asked God to start my truck, he not only started my old Bronco, he romantically filled my cab with a mm. song that said, I've, I've got you. And yeah, you've lost everything, but you're, gonna, you're about to find everything you ever need right here. Mm. And that was, that, I didn't do anything, but ask mm. God to start my truck. So mm. I don't have anything for your <laughs> listeners, except maybe just ask God for something small wow. and watch him do something big. Wow. And then at that point in my life, I started to move the, the surrender took place because uh, I had to. I, I didn't really willfully surrender my musical career, mm. but I, I did surrender it ultimately because I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't willfully surrender my marriage, but it just happened. I, and ultimately, I didn't willfully surrender really my whole life because I was a control freak. Mm. But in that moment, all that kind of happened, and I realized there was an author writing something bigger, more beautiful in my story, even to the point where he's putting moments together eight years prior mm. that this God is romantically involved in my life. And especially in the broken pieces, because that's where he's doing his best work. Mm. So that moment gave me hope, gave me strength. It washed away anxiety. I felt warmth come over my body like I've never felt before. It was a miracle moment for me. I was born again Christian you know, when I was eight years old and I had all kinds of rededications. But in that moment, I really felt completely immersed and born again mm. in God mm. and not not just saved or justified, but fully alive. And mm. that's where that's kind of where hope started. And then from there, I know I'm talking a lot here, but no, it's beautiful. There's, a, there's a couple things that really sparked regrowth for me. It was reaching out to the least of these, I truly believe that in moments of brokenness, when we're in need, mm. when we're struggling, the best thing we can do is serve other people. Mm. And in that, you find your hope again. You find your purpose. Um, you know, in Matthew, Jesus makes it pretty clear at the end of Matthew, he said uh, that he waits for us among the poor and the afflicted. He waits for us among the least of these. And when we connect with people in need, um, we connect in a special way to Jesus himself. And in that, there's a miracle that happens. Uh, we become alive. We become purposed. We become abundantly filled with joy and hope when we serve. So anybody out there that's really struggling with, you know, depression or hopelessness, the, the very first thing I can tell you to do is to serve other people. And second is, is to be in community, to rely on your friends, talk to your friend. Don't isolate during, during times like this. I was 
I kind of tend to isolate because I'm, I, you know, most musicians or people who are on stage a lot are really um, recluses. They're they're not like people persons, I guess. <laughs> but it, it's important to just really rely on friends. And you were uh, instrumental for me in that, Jamie. For years, you were like, "Hey, let's just go build a fire somewhere and uh, hang out and talk about what stinks in our lives." You know, so don't be afraid to reach out to other people and, and to have community. There's people out there that care about you, whether it's a brother or a sister or just a friend, reach out to them because they want to be in community too. So serve people, be in community. Those two things can heal a broken heart and give hope. So beautifully said. And it, it does feel like, it, I was reading a little bit this past week about how the, the, the Spanish flu, the pandemic that came through, which I, I didn't really remember because I don't, you know, we don't talk a whole lot about that in history yeah. about the second world war or prohibition or whatever, but apparently like right before the roaring twenties around 1919, um, there was a quarantine and millions of people died and, and a lot of parallels a hundred years ago to what we're going through now, but we didn't have this gift of technology that we could do what we're doing right now. Yeah. And you know, when yeah. we set up this time to call, I'm like, I'm looking forward to uh, you, you. Your story always inspires me. <laughs> Talking about the Bronco, I get emotional every time you tell the story. It doesn't matter how many yeah. times I've heard it. Um, so part of me is thinking, oh, I can't wait to share this story with people out there. But I'm like, I get to connect with Mark. I get to see yeah. him. And and yeah. and we are a lot of like. I do think sometimes it's like, like a quarantine. Hmm, that could be actually really great for a while. <laughs> I got yeah. a, lot, a lot of musician friends that are like, what's so bad about not talking yeah. to you? I've written so many songs. I mean, it's like, man. Yeah, I'm getting a lot done. Yeah. Um, but, but really, I love what you said, being intentional. And we can be intentional. We do have the benefit technologically to actually, if we put the effort forward, to find somebody who might need a phone call or need a yeah. connection. Yeah, you, you, you. This became pretty transformational for you in beginning to really look outward, and in, in particular, paying to the needs, uh, paying attention to the needs of orphans. And I know your parents kind of inspired that in you. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about uh, what happened after Audio Adrenaline and in, in how you got involved in the nation of Haiti? Sure. Yeah, right at the end of Audio Adrenaline's career, uh, about two years before our last concert, we had started a nonprofit. Uh, and a ministry towards uh, the kids in crisis in Haiti, the orphaned and abandoned. Um, and, you know, three years later, our, our platform that kind of generated all the funding was over. So we're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? But it, I really feel it was obvious to us that God was just directing us to go as part of our story. And what was next is to serve in Haiti. So after I lost my voice, I just kind of jumped in full throttle into serving the least of these or the, the poor and the afflicted. I mean, there's poor and afflicted everywhere, you know, emotionally, uh, economically. But for me, I connected with Haiti. I fell in love with it at an early age. Haiti was like a second home for me. And, and a part of me honestly wasn't like, I need to go connect with the poor. It was Haiti for me was an escape to get, no one knew me there as a failed musician. No one, mm. no one knew me there mm. as a divorce A. That I was just Mark, the son of a missionary. And there mm. it, it felt new again. I felt new again. So it, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to need to go connect with the poor so that I can redo and start my life. It was really almost a selfish thing for me to go to Haiti. But do you, but, do you, think, that, do you think that's part of like so much? When we try and think of like, oh, I, I need to do this for God or be obedient or I, I should go do a good thing. Do you think most of it's kind of all tainted? Like it's just this kind of, there's two sides to every coin. Like there's this part oh, I think of me. So. Yeah. Like part of me, there is some selfishness that shows up and there's this really beautiful part of me that's kind of alive in Christ too. Do you feel like we show up in the world that way? I do. I think so. And I also feel like God puts things in our hearts, like desires in our hearts to go do things too. So I think, yeah, there's both sides of that. But at that point in my life, it, it really wasn't like, I mean, there was part of me that I wanted to go help, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there was definitely a, a part of it that was, I want to be away from here and yeah. get away from all the failure and the embarrassment of what I just, and, and just the, the reminders of loss. Mm -hmm. um, That's and, 
Yeah. And then there in Haiti, literally, I, I just saw Jesus and, and just miracles start to happen, like stories of redemption. Like you see lives being changed by something really small that you could contribute to. Mm. And that became beautiful. And I replaced the loss of a music career and being able to stand up in front of thousands of people and hopefully inspire them to the beauty of just serving one kid. Or, and it was equal, if not even bigger, you know. Mm -hmm. So all that, there was a shift in what was significant, you know, and it took me a long time. I'm not a quick learner. <laughs> it took me a long time to realize kind of the beauty and the, I don't know, the irony of God's mathematics, I guess, or logic mm -hmm. or the way he works. Um, and that's what's helping me today, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm not really significant right now at all, except here in my little house, you know, mm -hmm. I can be the best dad that I can be. Mm -hmm. And that's just as important as being the best musician or rock star mm -hmm. or the best missionary I can be today the very best husband. I can serve my wife or my mother-in-law or my parents. I can make a phone call. And those things are just as significant as anything that's being done in Washington, D.C. or wherever. Mm. Um, and we have to remember that as human beings, we have to affect what we can affect mm. and, and be positive where we can make that change. Yeah, I remember that book by Dallas Willard, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, and he talks about a kingdom is is whatever. I love that we can af we affect what we can affect. The kingdom is kind yeah. of essentially what's what's in our little sphere. Yeah. And for most of us, our kingdoms were really shrunk. Yeah, like this you know this is the and yet isn't Jesus teaching is hey, there's a much bigger kingdom out there, and if you'll align with it and with me in the way, then. Yeah. Yeah, somehow you'll see the light of God differently and show up in the world differently, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, I, go ahead. No, I was just going to say you're an adoptive parent, and yeah. and and talk about. I mean, because it's interesting. I love what you just said. Who you are as a dad right now, it's it's just as significant as who you were as that father who adopted those children out of a really difficult circumstance. Like that feels like. Like I would imagine, I'm not an, a, a, not a father who's adopted children, but I would imagine it feels, feels pretty significant in that moment when you adopt kids who are in a really difficult circumstance, like, oh, okay, I'm really, I'm affecting their lives, plucking them out of this situation and they're a new one. But it doesn't change, right? Like you're still a dad today showing up in this kind of average day and the yeah. significance is, it's, it's just as powerful right now as it was the moment of adoption. Yeah, every day is... Uh, yeah, a chance to to really be born again and really to kind of recreate your life all over again. You know, yeah. that's, um, that's true. And that once you realize that, uh, your measurement of of significance and success is quite different, uh, which is cool. And, and I forgot I, I didn't really go into what happened after Audio Eight, so I did go to Haiti and we started this ministry called the Hands of Feet Project. I got off on a tangent. Sorry. No, that's and, good. Oh, that's good. And we started serving kids, and we and it's still there today. I'm still part of the Hands and Feet Project, and they're dealing with the coronavirus there just as we are. But I'm praying to God it doesn't uh, has it, go has viral it the orphanage there. yet? No, it hasn't. Good, good. Um, they locked down pretty quick because um, everything else was locking down before anything really showed up. Okay. But Haiti, Haiti's been has its has its tragedies like no other place I've ever seen, mm -hmm. you know. So when, 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 I, when this first hit here in America, the coronavirus, it, it felt like the earthquake or a hurricane or cholera outbreak in Haiti and, or a, a political coup that happened. Haiti, a, over and This is their year, normal way of This is normal for them. For them right? yeah. yeah, and there is no grocery store you can go to. Right. They're out of control every day in Haiti. And that's another thing that you learn when you connect with someone who's in need mm -hmm. is you get to see what it really looks like to be even in less control than you are. Because mm -hmm. it's all a facade anyway, mm -hmm. control is. But you, it's an eye-opening experience of about how surrender. Um, and that's what was beautiful about working in Haiti for the last 14, 15 years is it, it rearranges how you, your perspective of the world. Uh, what's important. Haiti doesn't look at this life 
as significantly as we in America look at this life. We hold this life as the most important thing, is our comfort, uh, our control, um, uh, our someday, our retirement. Mm. That's, that's our heaven to us. That's our paradise. Is someday I'm going to make enough money to where I can just sit back and oh, everything's perfect. But the, irony, the reality is that that's, that's a lie, complete and utter lie. Mm-hmm. No matter how much money you make, no matter how comfortable you are, it, you're not in control. Mm-hmm. And just when you think you are, whoop, someone, it, the carpet's ripped out from money. So that's what I've learned from Haiti is just to be okay with the carpet being ripped out from under you. And this is what America's feeling right now. And that's really what life is all about is this long journey of learning how to surrender control. Do you think there's an opportunity for us as Americans to have a greater empathy since there's a great portion of the world that lives like this all the time? I think so. Um, I don't think we've reached that point yet because we're all just kind of freaking out about Mm -hmm. us and what we're going to do. But there's been a few comments like, hey, when we get this together, we're going to help other people, Um, which I love that, you know. But uh, I, you're totally right. This is how it, it's different. But th- this state of unknown, the state of being, right? Yeah, this yeah, the state of flux, the state of uncertainty, is an everyday life for most of the world. Mm-hmm. How am I going to live tomorrow? How am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to get clean water? I don't know. And if the rain doesn't come, this doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And we, and we've relied so long on systems and infrastructure mm-hmm. that when that get, rips apart. We're actually just learning what life really feels like. Wow. Uh, because we've been numb to real life because we've built this system of comfort and mm. control. Mm. And it's probably really good for us. <laughs> it actually is. It's good for our country to feel it because this is, this is really the reality that most of the world lives every day. So if that Mark Stewart who <clears throat> post the band just early on going back to Haiti, getting kind of immersed again, because you've been serving in Haiti for years anyway, but really throwing yourself into that work, healing and leaning into the uncertainty. If that Mark Stewart showed up at your door, said, hey, come on out here, sit on the front porch, let's have some coffee. And he looked at you and said, hey, I know you're feeling uncertain again. Yeah. This is what I want to remind you. What would sure. your old self say to yourself today? I, I would um, I would say don't. I know this is a bad phrase, but don't waste. Uh, what is it? Don't waste a good uh, tragedy or whatever. It is. <laughs> right, 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 right. In in moments like this, it, it's your time, really, to to lean into the Creator hmm. and, and to explore who you are, your true identity, because all that comes out in times like this. You're not going to die. Hmm. Yeah, probably. I mean, some right, people right, might, but right. but even if you do, um, I, you know, life ends in death anyway. But I don't want to belittle that. But there's there's something bigger than your life or what's in, what you think is important. But I would just say, God's in control. Um, lean into Him, and something beautiful is going to happen at the end of this that you could never imagine. You know, God, Jesus promised us this abundant life, and I feel like that really means. Uh, in essence, a life of the overflow. It's things that you never can imagine are going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and a big part of that is when we surrender what we hold on to, what we don't want to lose, we find something bigger and better. Mm-hmm. And um, so that old Mark would probably come to me and say, don't, I know you're anxious, but don't be anxious. I know you're frustrated, but don't be frustrated. This is a beautiful moment. And in a, in just a moment, you're going to realize what I was doing uh, during the process, and it's going to be it's going to be different. It might not look as significant as your business might not be as significant. You know, your career might not in, in a in a different perspective, but it's mm-hmm. going to be bigger and more beautiful. And mm-hmm. I'm that God's good. That's what I would tell myself. <laughs> I love that. So if folks wanted to hear a little bit more of your story, um, where could they, is the book out there like Amazon and all that stuff? Cause yeah, it's everywhere. You could, um, 
you kind of connect uh, to my, I have a, uh, a website called Mark Stewart Media, M-A-R-K-S-T-U-A-R-T, media.com. You can go there and order the book. You can get a free, um, you can get a chapter if you just want to check it out and get a free song uh, from my buddies, Kevin Max and Russ Taft, two of my favorite vocalists. And Wait, a story did they do a song that. together? Yeah, they sang, the, they redid the song Good Life, the song that came on in the Bronco. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and those two were like, Russ Taff is like, I don't know if people, your listeners out there know who he is, but I think he's one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Uh, he was the reason, well, one of the biggest reasons I became a singer was Russ Taff. Hmm. And then after I lost my voice, uh, Kevin Max stepped in and took over for the band Audio A. So these were kind of bookend vocalists. Wow. And they're, and they're both beautifully broken, redeemed people. Yeah. <laughs> Just in, in <laughs> There's amazing. a lot of flavor between those Oh two gosh, guys. man, they're amazing. Yeah. And uh, so they sing that a duet. I, I kind of sing on a little bit, squeak out a note. <laughs> but the song that I heard in the moment where God showed up in my Bronco, they recut it. Oh, man. And so you can get that free on that website. But you can also connect to the Hands and Feet Project, my, uh, some of my social media. I'm not a big social media person, but whatever. You can follow my family and our journeys. And you can connect to the Hands and Feet Project. Um, and definitely learn how you can help and get involved. If, if Haiti's on your heart and you want to do something there, you can sponsor a child You can and get involved in that way. And I, I say that um, not only because it, it changes that kid's life, that child's life, but it really does change your life when you connect with the poor yeah. and the yeah. least of these. If you're not doing that, connect to a child, make a difference in their life, give them hope. Um, and in doing so, let your kids and your family experience the beauty of God's storytelling because it's amazing. Beautiful. Mark, thank you so much for being with us. And, uh, and thanks for sharing all those things, man. I'm good to see your face. Yeah. Brother. Yeah. You do. Get together soon. Say hi to Aegis <laughs> and journey and Crystal, the in-law say hi to everybody for me. Tell Angie and the kids hi to you, man. I can't wait I to will. See you. I will. You too, brother. Take care. Bye.